Rainworld Downpour recently just released, and it literally has more content than the base game had. It's absolutely gigantic. It took me about three times as long to beat all of the five new Slugcat campaigns as it did to beat the base game when I first played it. And already beating the main game should make you way more prepared for beating the new content. So who knows how long it could take a player who's actually brand new to Rainworld to beat all this stuff. So I decided that after making my spoiler-free version of events, I'd also do a full spoiler spoiler filled video about Rainworld Downpour. This video has very major spoilers for literally everything in Downpour. Cause eight days is enough for people to beat everything, right? Right? You know what? People just ignore spoiler warnings anyway, don't they? They just want to know what happens in the game. They don't care. They're going to watch it anyway. But if you're still not done completing everything and you actually do care about spoilers and you really, really want to hear my opinions on stuff for some reason, then there will be timestamps for everything so that you can click around and skip the things that you don't want spoiled. And if you just want to hear my general thoughts on stuff, there's a timestamp for right at the end of the video where I talk about that sort of thing in a minimal spoiler kind of way. But before I get into the new five campaigns, first, I've got to talk about the new- wait. Did you see that? Oh, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an incredibly useful online learning platform that will help you grow the skills you already have and even learn some new ones if you're feeling up to it. It's extremely affordable and you're guaranteed to have people who actually know what they're talking about creating these courses. I've always felt like my editing is the weakest link when I make a YouTube video. So luckily for me, Skillshare has plenty of courses for video editing that talk about the same editing software that I use, formatted and explained in the most easily digestible way possible. In fact, a Skillshare course actually helped me edit my last video. So whether it's an attempt at a changing career path or just to improve at a hobby, Skillshare has tons of excellent material for you to learn it all from. It can be editing or music production or writing, pretty much anything you can possibly imagine has courses for you to learn from. So if you check out the link in the description, you can get access to all of that. And the first 1000 people who click that link get a free one month trial of Skillshare Premium. It's a fantastic product and I'm going to keep you using it to try and get my editing skills in tip-top shape. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Before we talk about the new campaigns, we've first got to talk about the new game modes and stuff they added. First off, there's a bunch of new stuff here in the arena tab. Like Safari mode, you get to hover around as a disembodied overseer and watch all the creatures do their thing in the ecosystem. But you can also take control over the creatures and move them around and stuff to see how they behave. Oh, ah, oh, oh. fuck him up! I'm an apex predator, look at me. So if you've ever really wanted to play as a pole plant, I guess you can do that if you want. There's also a challenge mode where there's a bunch of preset sandbox challenges that you can complete. Challenge mode was pretty hit or miss for me. Some of the challenges are pretty cool, but some of them are kind of uninteresting. Most of the challenges feel more like a puzzle mode than anything else, where instead of the challenge being to use your mechanics to escape or kill enemies, it's instead about like figuring out the solution to the problem, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that being the case. It can be fun sometimes, but the main game of Rainworld isn't much of a puzzle game at all, so it felt a bit weird to me. Almost like it's out of place. And there were some challenges that were all about killing stuff or whatever, and I enjoyed those challenges quite a lot. They also updated sandbox mode to add a bunch of the new items and stuff. They've got pretty much everything in here that you would possibly want to experiment with, so I guess that's... Wait, what? What is this one? They've got a gun now? He's getting rolled. Clearly the best game ever made. But if sandbox mode and challenge mode aren't really your thing, luckily, they also added another kind of challenge mode. It's called expedition mode. Expedition mode is much better at being a challenge mode than challenge mode is at being a challenge mode. It spawns you in a random shelter anywhere in the map, and it gives you between one to five challenges that you have to complete to succeed. Once you complete them all, you can sleep in a shelter and you win. If you die too much, the run will end. Dying with the lowest possible karma will kill your run's progress. Expedition mode is fantastic. It gives so much replayability to a game that otherwise didn't have that much. The variety in the challenges is huge, and you can change how easy or hard each challenge is. It's excellent. And if you don't like one of the challenges that the game tried to give you, you can just re-roll it. It gives you reasons to do things that you would never do usually, and go to areas that you would usually never go near. And unlike the challenge mode, expeditions actually feel more like the rain world that we're accustomed to, moving around the world trying to achieve some sort of goal just like you would in a campaign. Oh, and speaking of campaigns, the main attraction to downpour, and the thing that adds by far the most content, is the five new playable characters with all their unique stories. They're all very different from each other, and the story implications 
of their campaigns are completely wild. So let's just, you know, get to the main event, shall we? You know, the main event being where I just, you know, spoil the entire game for people who don't want to play it themselves. The Spearmaster is not the first Slugcat you unlock, but it's instead the first in the chronological order that the characters' stories take place in. The Spearmaster is the first Slugcat to come to these lands, long before the stories of the Hunter or Survivor, and every other Slugcat for that matter. The Spearmaster is a messenger. Your job is to bring a message to Five Pebbles, because he is ignoring all communications. You are sent by another iterator that you don't get to meet called Seven Red Sons, and you were genetically modified specifically to be a durable messenger that would survive this perilous journey. And you can infinitely generate spears and then use those spears to murder your way through to pebbles and say hello. These spears are also the way you feed. You can't eat creatures like the other characters do. You instead have to throw these white spears at enemies and that's how you sustain yourself instead. You throw your creepy butt spears at enemies and drink their insides. You can also use these spears to lodge into walls and climb around, which is extremely useful for getting to hard to reach places. You are a purposed organism built for the sole task of sending messages across vast distances, for when communication towers fall apart into disrepair, or for when angry self-destructive neighbours don't feel like answering your calls. All throughout your journey you can actually see these little radio broadcast signal dishes, and when you run up to them you can actually listen in to the communications of other iterators. I can only assume that this is just some sort of other skill that you have from being genetically modified into a terrifying abomination, because none of the other slug cats can have access to these text logs whatsoever. So Spearmaster has a lot of conversations to listen into along his journey. So you start your journey in the outskirts, and you make it all the way up to Five Pebbles. And when you do finally get to meet him, he is far from impressed. He rips a pearl straight out of your chest, reads it, and then promptly destroys the Red Overseers that have been following you, and throws you and the pearl straight out of the room. If you try and re-enter the room, he just kills you. So you're now very injured with a hole in your chest, but you have a pearl with some sort of important information stored on it. So what would the next obvious plan of action be? Take that pearl to the other supercomputer guy we know is lying around here somewhere. So that's what I did. Uh, kind of. We'll get to that later. So I went to the east, because that's where I know looks to the moon is. Because I've been there a million times, and I've played this game a million times. But when I arrived in the area, things looked a little bit different. Instead of entering shoreline, I entered waterfront facility. And things look very, very different here. Turns out, the Spearmaster's campaign doesn't just take place before everyone else's, it takes place so far in the past that the shoreline looks entirely different. And shoreline looks so different, because Moon is still alive. Moon is now dying. Pebbles has started taking all of her groundwater away from her, but she's still alive and still has most of her power at this point in the timeline, even though her communications aren't working properly. You give your disgusting chest pearl to her and she reads it and sees the gravity of the situation. She then rewrites it with a new message and asks you to take it to a communications array in the Sky Islands. Once you do that, the pearl broadcasts Moon's final message before her collapse and the game fades to black, essentially kicking off the entire story for the rest of the characters in the future. Spearmaster's campaign is great, and the character is extremely fun to play as well. The combat in Rainworld is really cool, so being a character that has to murder their way through everything is obviously really cool. And getting to see Moon while she's actually functioning is absolutely incredible. Being able to juxtapose this with what she looks like in the modern day is just crazy. But I did have one pretty large issue when I played Spearmaster myself. An issue that, in hindsight, makes me feel really, really dumb. Because you know that pearl that we talked about earlier? You know, the one that Pebbles tears out of your chest? You know, the one that Moon, like, uses to send her final message or whatever? Well, um, I didn't take it with me. I just didn't take it with me. See, the Spearmaster has to to eat with spears, right? Like, you have to throw spears at enemies to feed. So the other characters all get to store items in their stomach for later, which lets them keep two hands free. But the Spearmaster can't do that because it doesn't have a stomach because it doesn't eat food normally. So I was like, there's no way I'm taking this pearl with me. That'd be so difficult. That sounds cringe. I'm not going to do that. So I just didn't take it with me. I then proceeded to spend literally 20 hours bumbling around like a clown with my clown nose on, going to every single region in the game to see where the hell I needed to go to get an ending. Turns out, the pearl was the ending. 
I just needed to have taken it with me. But my guess at the time was that to get an ending, I somehow needed to get back to Seven Red Suns, because that's the iterator that sent me. But no, that's not at all how that works. You can't get back there, it's too far away. So I was just completely lost. I was so lost, in fact, that I had to literally ask someone who QA tested the game to tell me where to go to get an ending. Thanks, Turtle Toad. And once they told me, I felt pretty, pretty stupid, actually. And then I repeatedly honked my clown nose while I restarted my save file and went and did it all again. But other than my own stupidity, Spearmaster is a ton of fun. And it's a really awesome prequel story to what you get to see as the hunter and the survivor. And you do have to actually think about combat encounters. Because two spears isn't actually just an auto win in any combat scenario. Unlike, you know, some other characters' combat power that I could mention. Spearmaster actually has to be quite careful and quite clever. And without any crazy mobility or anything, you really just have to murder your way out of every single situation you find yourself in. Also, because the world is older, taking place long before the campaigns we're used to, some of the areas are completely different. Completely different and much, much scarier. Garbage Wastes is actually hell on earth as Spearmaster. There's this one room, one that I lovingly referred to as Ohio, that has a guaranteed red lizard spawn and frequently has three vultures in it. I'm not sure that the king vultures are guaranteed, spawns, but they were here a lot across multiple cycles. There's also the room with the rot in it. This room is always there as the other characters, but as Spearmaster, it's much more recent that Pebbles decided to flush out all of his cancer into the garbage wastes. So there's just one absolutely gargantuan daddy long legs floating around that's twice the size of a normal one and is bright purple. You can try and rip and tear through everything all the time, but honestly, I just tried to run through it without fighting. You also don't have to go through garbage wastes at all, but like, Where's the fun in that? Who doesn't want to go to Ohio? The next character in chronological order is Artificer. The Artificer takes place not too long after the Spearmaster. The world that Spearmaster traverses is exactly the same world that the Artificer goes through, give or take a tiny few differences. But the path you actually want to take is very different. Your main power is that you have bombs. You can make bombs, you're immune to bombs, and you yourself are a bomb. You can detonate yourself in the air to jump around, and your ability to craft bombs makes you incredibly lethal, and combat is usually no issue for the Artificer. The downside to this is that the scavengers really don't like you, and there's nothing you can do about it. No matter how many pearls you give them, or no matter how many times you save their lives, they still just despise you. And you hate them, too. Your one purpose in life is to murder scavengers. The Artificer begins in the garbage wastes, immediately after supposedly slaughtering your way through a scavenger toll. This little red drone wakes up next to you and starts following you around, and this guy proves to be very important later. There's also a new area to the right of this scavenger toll, which never used to be there. You go to the right out of this room and find a shelter, and when you sleep at the shelter you'll notice something strange. When you sleep, your karma does not go up. The Artificer is so angry and violent that you're an abomination, and you cannot be karmically favoured in any way. Your karma just doesn't go up. Your hatred for scavengers is so strong that it curses you. So you might be wondering how you get through karma gates if you can't increase your karma in any way. Well, you could go to the Echoes, which does increase your karma, but that would require going through more gates, so that doesn't seem like it's even possible. So let me just have a think about how I'll solve that problem. Oh, I know. I'll kill more scavengers, because that's how I solve every problem in my life, apparently. Other creatures have karma too, which means scavengers have karma, which means I can murder more scavengers and drag them to a karma gate and use their karma to open it. When you grab hold of a scavenger's body, you can actually see their karma in the bottom left, and you can then drag them around to use them to open gates for you. This might just be the coolest mechanic in the game, hands down. It's thematically appropriate for the character, it makes sense according to the lore, it adds extra challenge to go through gates, and it means that dying doesn't lose you any karma, because you don't have any karma to lose. It's actually a fantastic mechanic. It does make some gates inaccessible when scavengers don't appear in the area, but for those gates, there's always a way around. So it doesn't ever lock you out of an area. Every now and then, when you visit a shelter, the artificer will have a dream. And these dreams, more like flashbacks, will tell you the grim story of why you have such a fiery hatred for scavengers. Because the artificer had children. And upon trying to take them through a scavenger's hole, something unknown went 
went wrong and your kids got lost in the fray. So now you only have one goal in life, which is to murder your way through the world, killing every scavenger you see. The Artificer's journey can only really take you to one place, and that's Five Pebbles. The other two places that make a lot of sense to visit aren't accessible. Moon's deterioration since Spearmaster's campaign has made her completely inaccessible. The gates that Spearmaster used to get inside have either completely crumbled or been crushed by debris. And you can't go to Ascend either because you're so karmically screwed that you can't go to the depths and survive the Karma Guardians. So only one place makes any sense. If you're approaching from Shoreline, you're not going to be able to take the gate into Pebbles from Underhang. So you're going to have to go left through Underhang to try and get through this little wacky platforming challenge. But you can technically just do a little bit of scav murder to get through the gate from Chimney Canopy straight to the wall. Once you start climbing the wall, you'll notice that there's scavengers up here, which certainly isn't the case when you play the characters from the future. You'll also notice this funny looking gate. I wonder if this gate's important. I wonder if this will come up later. I wonder if the YouTuber's mentioning it because of foreshadowing re when you reach Pebbles, he tells you that despite being stuck in a cycle and wanting a way out just like every other living thing, you can't actually do this. Your rage for the scavengers is too great to allow you to ascend, and even he can't do anything about that. He then tells you that your little red drone from earlier is actually a citizen ID drone from when the ancients used to live in the cities atop the iterators. He tells you that you and him have a common enemy, and that's the scavengers. The scavengers are looting his city, and they're damaging the roof of his structure in the process. And since you hate them so much, and since you're now one of his honorary citizens, maybe you should go pay them a visit. So that's what you do. You go to this gate from earlier, and your ID drone lets you in. You go to the city and start doing a bunch of murder. You rip and tear your way through the scavenger population until you reach this giant dome, almost like a coliseum. And in this dome, one scavenger sits atop a throne in the center of the room. It has a giant mask with pearls hanging off of it, and it has a citizen ID drone following it around too. And this guy's citizen ID drone points out danger and the like, just like the overseers occasionally do for you as other characters. Of course, your first instinct is murder, so you start throwing bombs at it, but it's incredibly tanky. Turns out, it's actually wearing armor. Armor that is made out of red centipede scales. The King Scav is basically invulnerable. I direct hit it with three bombs in a row, and it was still alive and kicking. But it's not completely invulnerable, and eventually you can kill it, even though it's really quite tough. And when you do finally kill it, you become their king. Another interesting note is that if you did happen to visit any Echoes and increase your karma, killing and eating the King Scav will remove all of that gained karma and put you back to zero. The Artificer's story is an excellent one, because in classic Rainworld fashion, not every single character needs to be a traditional protagonist with massive impact on the overarching lore of the universe. You know, sometimes that's fun. Sometimes it's cool to be a messenger or whatever, but sometimes just having a creature do its own thing is cool too. And if you go back into your save file, you wake up atop the King Scavenger's throne, and you now wear its mask. Its mask works just like a vulture mask does, scaring away lizards, but it also makes all scavengers friendly to you, because those are the perks of being the king, I guess. The Artificer had the campaign that I personally found the easiest, because your bomb-throwing shenanigans are just too powerful. You can solve practically any situation you find yourself in with throwing bombs at stuff. It's really as simple as that. Bombs and explosive spears one-shot basically everything. You're one of the most mobile characters in the game, and you're also the best in combat. And I did really love going into the city. Going to the city is so cool. It's something that I've always wanted to do, and I've wished would be an area in the game previously. It's so prominent in the background during your walk across the top of Five Pebbles, and you get to go there and slaughter your way through a bunch of scavengers. It's incredible. It's exactly what I would have asked for. After the Artificer's story, there's quite a large time jump before a new playable character comes into the mix. The next in the timeline is the Hunter, who is sent as a messenger to revive Moon. But after the Hunter, we have our favourite little fat bastard, the- the Gormand is very fat. He ate all the pies, so you're now quite slow, especially compared to some of the other characters in the game. But that slowness gets even worse if you jump around too much or throw stuff too frequently. You get all tired out, and you can't move very fast because you're a fat bastard. But despite that, Gormand has a lot of things going for him, and Gormand is a uh, really quite the weird character, actually. They have the most unique strengths to boast about by far. Like, you're meant to be slow, and generally you are slow, but you can sort of do some weird things to circumvent that.
<laughs> One of Gorman's upsides is meant to be his fatness. You can jump from higher places onto enemies and it will deal damage, and it deals a lot of damage too. But they also decided that Gorman should have a really big slide, bigger than the other characters, so that you can slam yourself into stuff by sliding into them and it will deal damage to them. Which means that you're slow, but you're also fast. The Gorman can also craft things. Clever little fatso, this one. You can take two different items in each hand and mush them together in the middle to craft something new. And you can craft a whole bunch of useful items in a pinch, which can save your ass a lot. And you can also spend food pips to regurgitate random items from your stomach, which you can then use to craft even more stuff. In fact, the Gormand can actually craft an arena exclusive item in his campaign. It's called a Singularity Bomb. This is completely ridiculous. The crafting recipe is insanely difficult, and for good reason, but the fact that you can craft this is completely bonkers. But there's other things you can do with your cleverness. Like, you can also take two different food items in each hand and eat them together as a meal, which gives you three food pips for the price of two. And also, that tiredness mechanic that we mentioned earlier, where you get all tuckered out when you move around too much, that can actually be used to your advantage. You see, the Gormand knows he's fat. Look at his face. Tell me this is the face of someone who doesn't know full well exactly what they are. He's a chubby bastard and he's proud of it. And he knows that he won't be able to throw too many spears too often because he'll tire himself out. So to make up for it, when the Gormand does throw a spear, he throws it with the might of a thousand suns. The Gormand can only throw one spear before he tires himself out, but he makes that one spear count. The Gormand spear throws deal the most damage out of any character in the game by a long way. You can one-shot most lizard types with this. So the Gormand has a lot of things going for him, which is really interesting and makes him super fun to play. He is really fat though. Gorman starts out in Shaded Citadel, which is clever on the game devs part, because it gives you a really great logical reason to teach new players the crafting system to make themselves a lantern to get themselves out of Shaded. The Gorman's world is pretty much exactly the same as the world from the Hunters and Survivors time, so finding your way around should be very easy if you're familiar with the game. You can go see Moon, and she's in a similar state to when Survivor sees her, but when you visit Pebbles, he'll give you the mark, and then he'll tell you that you're fat. Well, he says rotund, but that's fat, right? Rotund is fat. And then he'll tell you that more and more of your kind keeps frequenting his facility and that he locked the grounds to his facility to prevent this. But locking the grounds also prevents you from escaping, so he realises it doesn't make sense and he unlocks it again. This unlocks a gate in Subterranean that takes you to a location called the Outer Expanse. Travel far enough west and you will eventually find a clan of slug cats. And then you go home and tell them all your stories of your wild adventures you just went on and it's all cute and happy ending and stuff. The Gormand has his own little life out here. He doesn't want to ascend because he's got a family to take care of. You can ascend as the Gormand as well as pretty much every other character, but that's an incredibly underwhelming ending for most of the characters. The Gormand is certainly the strangest character that they added to the game, by a long way, because the Gormand has the most unique intricate mechanics out of anybody. The devs must have been smoking some good good shit when they came up with this. It's completely crazy. Like look at this clip of me killing a lizard. Look at it. Just look at it. It's completely ridiculous. I'm bashing my face into this lizard until he dies. You're slow, except sometimes you're not slow. And you're defenseless, except sometimes you're not defenseless. It's an extremely interesting character, and I liked it way more than I expected to when I looked at him in the trailers. I enjoyed it because it feels really wacky, and it feels like you have a million different ways to solve all your problems. It's extremely satisfying. And it's always nice to get a happy and wholesome ending every now and then. Especially from a game like Rain World, which is so bleak. Rain World is usually always like... It's good to get a nice ending sometimes, what can I say? The best part of Gormand is actually what comes afterwards. After beating the Gormand, the gate to the Outer Expanse also becomes unlocked for the Survivor and the Monk and they also get brand new endings. So now every single character in the entire game, aside from two, have unique endings. It's great. The Gorman story doesn't impact the overarching lore very much, but I think that's fine, because sometimes that's a good thing. But our next slug cat takes us far into the future, long after the survivor and monk have passed, and their impact on the story is much more obvious and much more great, and the world looks pretty different this far into the future.
The Rivulet is really fast. Like, that's it. That's the whole thing. Rivulet's just really fast. Their power is their movement. You can run really fast, jump really high, and breathe underwater. And that breathing underwater part might seem trivial, but it comes in real handy in the world you actually find yourself in. This takes place far into the future, and the rain cycles come far more frequently than they ever did before. You start your campaign in Drainage System, and no matter if you go to Moon or Pebbles first, you will already have the mark and the ability to hear what they say. You also start with a pearl in your stomach that you can give to Moon to read. This pearl seems to be a layout or map of the inside of Pebbles, probably a map to help you reach the interior of his structure, which makes me think that the Rivulet is yet another messenger sent to help, although the game never actually confirms this like it does with the other characters that are seen as messengers. And as the diligent little messenger that you probably are, you go to Pebbles, and Pebbles is not in a good place. The rot is taking over, and the reason for such frequent rain is that he's trying to to flush all the rot out of his system, but he's unable to do so. When you meet him, you find him sitting on the floor of his can, barely able to move. He gets pretty mad at your presence and explains the situation he's in. He also has a pearl that plays a piece of music, a hymn that the ancients made, encoded into this pearl, because he doesn't really have anything else to pass the time with now that he barely functions. He then asks you for a favour. He says there's a gravity cell inside of his core that gives him power and allows him to keep trying to flush out the rot. Without this core, he'll start to die. He asks you to take this energy cell out and take it to Moon and plug it in for her. So you have to make your way all the way through the rot infested carcass of five pebbles to find this energy cell and take it out. When you do, the gravity switching on and off stops and the frequency of the rain goes back to normal and you now have a gravity switch right in your hands. You can activate it to lower gravity and do massive super jumps all over the place. You then take that cell to Moon and show it to her and she immediately says, you probably killed someone for this, didn't you? You then have to go out of Moon and take this cell deep down below shoreline into Moon's internals that are all underwater. This area is called the Submerged Superstructure. Inside of this area is a place to plug this cell in and reactivate some of Moon's functionality. And when you find it and plug it in, you get kicked out onto the destroyed city that once sat atop Moon's superstructure. You then make your way out of this area to go see Moon again. She has all of her overseers connected again and her anti-grav is working in her chamber. She's not completely repaired, but she's much better off than she was before. So as the Rivulet, you have the biggest impact on the overarching story so far. You seal the fate of Pebbles and you power on Moon for the first time in God knows how long. But then after all that, you become Moon's little pet. If you go back into your save file, you wake up laying at her feet and she calls you Ruffles. Ruffles! Considering they created a character for the sole purpose of being fast and having caffeine for blood, it's surprising that Rivulet was actually relatively difficult. Running through the normal regions isn't too hard because you're generally just too fast for most things to catch you. But that crazy fast move speed has to come in clutch when you're trying to outmaneuver all of the terrifying beasties that float around in submerged superstructure. And when you're rummaging around inside of five pebbles, there are terrifying tentacle monsters literally everywhere. And once you actually retrieve the gravity cell, your mobility goes up a massive amount, but you also lose the ability to throw things and defend yourself, because both hands are occupied by carrying around this big gravity cell. So you really do rely solely on your movement and nothing else. The Rivulet story is awesome, and it puts some open-ended questions out there, like why you have the mark and a pearl before meeting any iterators. Maybe you're a messenger, or maybe you come from far away enough to have already met an iterator before. The lore speculation potential is large, and when I play Rivulet, I actually did bump into an issue. It was another issue caused by my own stupidity, but it was an issue. When I took the gravity cell to Moon, she says she doesn't know if there's a way to get inside her internals. But I already knew that there was an access shaft right above her head, so I went up there. Turns out that that isn't where you're meant to go at all. So I spent a good 15 to 20 minutes just looking around up there, and there's nothing there. At first it felt dumb that there'd be a red herring like that, and I was annoyed by it. But then I realised that you come out of Bitter Airy up there after plugging the gravity cell in. So this access shaft being here is actually how you come out of submerged superstructure. So it actually makes perfect sense. There's a reason this pipe is unmarked after all. It's just that my gamer senses tingled too hard and I got lost up there. The final slug cat takes place with another even longer time jump into the future. A time jump that takes you far enough for the rivulet to have died of old age since then. And the world looks a whole lot different.
The Saint, to my surprise, turned out to be my favourite character. The Saint is wild. The pure gameplay of the character isn't necessarily my favourite. That's too hard to choose. But as a whole package, with gameplay, story and aesthetics all bundled in, the saint was definitely my favourite. The saint's tongue is like really long and you can use it to grapple onto surfaces to swing around and evade predators. And you need this mobility because the saint can't throw spears. So you're forced to outmanoeuvre creatures instead of fighting them and you have no other option. The saint can also sense when echoes are in the area. Your screen will flicker and an audio cue will occur any time you wake up in a shelter with an echo in the region. And this power comes in handy a little while later. The Saint's campaign takes place a very, very long time into the future. There's no more rain. The rain never comes at the end of a cycle. But instead of the rain being a weather event you need to avoid, instead the world has entered an ice age. It's constantly snowing and there are giant blizzards that regularly occur. And you will freeze to death if you stay outside in the cold for too long. This does technically mean that a cycle can never end and you never have to shelter. But in practice this is very difficult to do because as the cycle goes on for longer the blizzards get larger and more fierce making everything colder and you'll most likely freeze to death before you ever reach anything important in this long period of time. There is some respite from the cold though. Scavenger's lanterns will give you a source of warmth. Carrying one around will keep you from freezing to death in the lighter snow and it allows you to regenerate your warmth while you're inside away from the harsh blizzards. And the saint also only starts with two max karma which I thought was odd for a character like the same. It seems like, thematically, you're meant to be very karmically adjusted or whatever. But apparently not, which means that you have to go and get echoes to take karma gates. And you'll need every single echo in the game if you want to go to the Void Sea with 10 karma for any reason at all. The Saint wakes up in Sky Island in the middle of a blizzard and is forced to find shelter quickly before freezing to death. You can then get the echo in Sky Islands and go straight to Chimney Canopy. Get the echo in Chimney Canopy and go to the wall. I just want to go see Five Pebbles. The gate's pretty close by and I should be able to see Oh. Oh dear. Pebbles just isn't here anymore. So I guess my only option is to go to Shoreline. Moon makes the most sense, right? Since Pebbles just doesn't exist, apparently. So I go to Shoreline. And Shoreline is hell on Earth. All of the enemies from Submerged Superstructure have been displaced by the activation of Moon. So they're now all on the surface. Way more Leviathan than ever before. And giant jellyfish are now on the surface instead of deep under the water. And you have to somehow swim under these things or climb over them without dying. It's really terrible. It's also freezing cold and Shoreline is mostly open air so you freeze to death pretty fast out here. But when you make it to Moon she can already talk to you and you already have a mark. But this time I don't think I'm a messenger, funnily enough. But we'll get to that a little bit later. She says that you're a strange little creature that reminds her of a visitor that long since passed away. And this makes me very sad. Poor Ruffles. She doesn't really say much else. She just says that it gets cold and she's glad that creatures like you can still survive in these harsh environments. So now I don't really know where to go. So I think to myself well if I go through Shade Citadel, I'll get back to Industrial Complex, I guess, and then I can go get all the Echoes or something. So that's where I go. I make my way to the Shaded Citadel entrance. But the entrance to Shaded Citadel starts to look really different really fast. It's been completely crushed. Following this route briefly eventually takes you to somewhere that looks suspiciously like Underhang. And that's because it is underhang. Five Pebbles' entire can has fallen into the ocean. He has completely collapsed and crushed most of Shaded Citadel with it. Only a tiny amount of the west of Shaded Citadel is still intact as how you remember it. Most of Shaded Citadel has been completely crushed by Pebbles' can. And you can climb up inside of it to see the husk of what used to be Five Pebbles. It's almost completely unrecognisable. There isn't even Daddy Longlegs around. There's no rot anywhere. There's just warped metal with the occasional familiar looking room. If you you go to Shaded Citadel from Industrial Complex, you can even see what used to be the wall. Perfectly intact rooms that used to be the wall, completely crushing what parts of Shaded Citadel used to be here. To the east of all this mess is one of his legs, still standing, and that has an echo on top of it. Climb your way up the centre of all of this mess and you'll find a familiar face, sitting there out in the open air barely alive. He can barely talk, let alone remember anything. He just sits and tries to play back his hymn off of this pearl. That same pearl that he had when Rivulet met him a long time before. Pebbles is completely non-functional and Moon doesn't say much, so there's only one logical step left to take. Go to the depths and just see what happens. So I go around finding all of the echoes and when I acquire my final echo, this happens. My eyes are now open and suddenly I've unlocked a new power. 
If I had to ask you what you think the craziest and most surreal thing to have happen next would be, what would you say? Because if you'd say, can fly and kill things with my mind, then apparently you'd be right. The saint becomes an all-powerful god of death that can pop any creature in existence to kill it instantly. Although the word kill isn't used, the game calls it performing an ascension. So this got me thinking. It got me thinking real good. So I went back to Pebbles. Oh! And I made him ascend. Then I did the same to Moon. Oh! Because apparently the saint has the power to kill gods, to permanently break them from their cycles. But why do I have this power? Well, to explain that, we need to go and ascend. Or at least try to, anyway. But actually, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Because ascension doesn't quite work the same as saint as it does with every other character. Because where the depths used to be, there is now nothing. I guess so much time has passed that all of this has just dissolved into the void sea. And if you jump into the hole, you just keep falling. And falling. And falling more. Until eventually you arrive at an area called Rubicon. Rubicon apparently means this. Who knew? I didn't. This area is really weird. There's Karma Guardians, there's new creatures, and recolors of old creatures. It's pretty wacky in here. You have to use your magical ascension powers to fly around and survive. And to be honest, I didn't really like this area very much. This is the one area in the whole of the game that I actually disliked. There's nothing really wrong with it, it's just too big. The gimmick of flying around and popping stuff with your mind is fun for a little while, but it's not that fun. This area is really, really cool, but this region forces you to use that gimmick the entire time. And if the region was smaller, it would be fine, but it gets a bit old because you have to do it so much to find your way through this ginormous area to get to where you need to go. But thematically, this area area is awesome. Rubicon is made up of twisted versions of rooms that you've already seen all throughout the world. All of it tinted a sickening gold. Eventually, you arrive at a void-touched version of Underhang, and you then make your way up what looks like a completely destroyed version of Five Pebbles, before you finally fall into his chamber to meet two familiar faces. These two only appear here if you went and ascended them before coming here. If you got your god powers and immediately went to Rubicon, this room will be empty. You then get some unique lines of dialogue and then swim off into the void sea and on come the void worms. Except this time, something quite different happens. The saint is literally a god of death. Whether this void worm died or was just injured is completely unknown, but the saint's attack on it allows them to travel back to the real world from the void sea, being the only creature we know of to be able to see beyond the Rubicon and come back. And this has completely crazy consequences for the story of Rainworld. When Pebbles and Moon appear in the Rubicon, they say that it couldn't have been possible for them to solve their great problem because they could never have told the real solutions from the faulty ones. Like they were trying to understand what lies beyond the point of no return while having yet to pass it. But you, the saint, this tiny little green being, can pass it and return. And your ability to do this is what allows you to ascend other creatures with your mind. You have likely existed for eons in a constant cycle of reincarnation, just as a solution to the Iterator's great problem of breaking the cycle that they worked on for their entire existence. But this isn't where the wackiness ends, actually. Now, this might not actually be canon, because it's not actually in the Saints campaign. However, in challenge mode, in challenge number 70, the Saint is seen ascending another Iterator, that being none other than Sliver of Straw. For anyone who doesn't know, Sliver of Straw is the only Iterator that ever said they had a solution to their great problem on how to break the cycle, and Sliver of Straw died shortly after sending the signal to confirm this to everybody else. And tucked away in challenge mode is Sliver of Straw being killed by the saint. So again, I don't know if this is actually canon, but if it is, it would mean that the saint is the solution to the problem they were designed to solve. The saint is the triple affirmative, and God knows where they came from or how they came into being. The lore speculation potential of the saint is completely out of this world which is why the Saint ended up being my favourite campaign of them all by a long way. So many times when playing through this campaign, my jaw was completely on the floor. The environmental storytelling is fantastic. The moment you see this screen, you know exactly what's up. And the familiarity of some rooms amongst all of the wreckage are 
achieves that exact same feeling. And seeing Pebbles for the first time like this had me completely stunned. The Saint is definitely the craziest of all the characters. The craziest stuff happens, and as the final character that's meant to be a bookend to the entire story, it does an amazing job at being a climactic finale. So here's my overall thoughts and final conclusion on Downpour. And this part will be spoiler free just in case you skipped ahead. The short answer is that I loved it. It felt like a faithful continuation of everything the base game had without stepping on its toes. Before it released, I was very worried that it would be too complicated and wacky to feel true to the original Rain World experience, but it actually isn't too wacky at all. Even when it goes completely off the rails and does crazy stuff, it still feels contained within the world and doesn't ruin anything for me at all. My favourite campaign was The Saint, because that shit's wild, but my favourite from a pure gameplay standpoint is clearly Gourmand. Just look at it. This DLC added such a colossal amount of content that I'm actually astonished by it. It's so much bigger than the base game, and that is not what I expected. And I do have my criticisms, mainly that one part of Saint that I complained about, but overall, I enjoyed it tremendously. I do wish there was some online multiplayer, but obviously, I understand why that's not a possibility. Networking isn't exactly easy to do. But Downpour is excellent, clearly worth the wait we all endured for it, which is why I was able to ramble for about 42 minutes about it. And with Expedition Mode added in, I'll be able to keep playing it for the foreseeable future too, because that's a crazy amount of replay value. So I can have even more moments like this. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Thanks for watching.